much for joining us today. My name is Ian Scott, and I am the founder of Scott Legal. And today we are going to talk about the EB-5 green card, the investor green card, and different options. And we're going to look at both regional center options and direct investment options. Now, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. The firm is a full-service immigration firm, but we do have a particular focus on investor-based visas, such as E2 visas and also EB-5 visas. And we process those EB-5 visas both in the regional center context and have a number of clients who have either moved from E2 to EB-5 under direct investment or just started their EB-5 process under the indirect investment umbrella. Uh, in terms of after the presentation, after the webinar, we are going to send you a number of things. We're going to send you a copy of this PowerPoint presentation. We'll send you a link where you can see this video. We do post the videos on YouTube, so we do encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we post videos on a number of immigration topics often, so you will be able to get updates and hit the subscribe button and you'll be able to get updates on uh, all of those relevant and interesting information uh, immigration topics. The other thing is that we will send you is a link where you can set up a consultation to set up uh, to to go through your particular situation and go through the EP five requirements in more detail. And finally, we will um, also. Uh, send you information on uh, a guide. So it's it's information that uh, we will go through in this presentation, but the guide has a number of different pieces of, you know, just more details. So you have something in writing that you can uh, constantly refer to in terms of uh, in terms of referring to the EB-5. If you do have any questions throughout the, the process, uh, do feel free to put them into the question and answer box or the chat box, we will get to all the questions, so don't worry about that. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, we will start with um, the presentation. So the first thing we'll talk about is the regional center versus the direct investment options. Now, the uh, EB-5 program, you know, they're, they're both two options. They have similar requirements, they're not exactly the same. But, uh, you know, one of the things that the biggest question that we get is, you know, which one should I invest in? Should I do a regional center or should I do a direct investment? And the answer really depends because they do have different characteristics. So, for example, a regional center really might be more suited for someone who is a fairly passive investor, um, someone who just wants to give the money to someone and have them worry about the job creation and taking care of everything else. The uh, the the for someone who's investing in a regional center, they're really only interested in getting the green card. The you know regional centers have very high administration fees and uh, they have very low returns. So uh, the 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 primary objective of a person doing this would be that they want to get the green card. And um, the one good thing about the regional centers is that indirect jobs are counted. So if the regional centers might be something like, for example, the Hilton or a different hotel chain that wants to raise capital through the EB-5 program, and they say, okay, well, we're going to raise, uh, you know, $800,000 per investor, and we want 50 investors, and we're going to use that to build a hotel. Well, what ends up happening is the other part of the requirement that we're going to talk about where you create U.S. jobs uh, indirect jobs can be counted for regional centers. So you can say, okay, well, the hotel is going to have knock-on impact because it's going to have uh, dry cleaner, it's going to have food establishments and all of these different, different things that are maybe providing services to the hotel and those all create jobs as well. So there's an economist that drafts a report that indicates that indirect you know, jobs and have quantified the number of indirect jobs that can be created. So that can be very useful and that can't be done in the direct investment context. Um, with a direct investment, the person really does want control over their destiny. So they might be someone that's on an E2 and the person uh, decides that they want to convert from an E2 to a green card to an EB-5. And uh, they invest the requisite amount of funds to be able to, to do this. So someone who really wants control over their, process, uh, their own uh, destiny and also someone who maybe is interested in return because the direct investment is just a, a business. So it's one investor and they have a business or the, the one, only one person can get a green card from any individual business. So it can be you investing in someone else's business. It can be you starting your own business, et cetera. But uh, really, you know, you, you have a bit more control over your own destiny. Only direct jobs are counted, as I mentioned before. The other good thing about the direct investment is the program is not subject to reauthorization. This can be a problem uh, because the regional center program does have to be reauthorized every several years. So, and in the past, there, has, there was once a problem with that and it made it so that it was difficult to have these applications administered. So 
Um, you know, so a number of different considerations when you're looking at whether to invest in a regional center or a direct investment project. So now let's get to the crux of the EV5 requirements. So the EV5 requirements are really broken up into two different components. So one component is the investment component, and the other big component is job creation. So let's talk about the investment first. So in order to get an EV5, you do have to invest either 800,000 or 1,050,000. And the choice of which one of those two you're going to invest is going to be, depend on where the business is located. So if the business is located in what's called a targeted employment area, so that's either an area where the unemployment rate is at least 1.5 times the national average. So the unemployment rate now is just over 4%. So just over 6% would be uh, would meet that requirement. And that's going to be at the time of investment. Or a rural area, which is going to be designated by the local jurisdiction based on the population. So those are both considered TEAs. And if you are investing in a TEA, then that means you're going to be able to invest 800000 rather than the $1,050,000. So the investment can really be anything that's related to getting the business up and running, but you can't include administrative fees, such as the amount you pay to your accountant or the amount that you pay to your lawyer. Or if you're doing a regional center, you can't include the administration fee that a regional center will charge, which could be $35,000, dollars 50000 You can't include that as fee either. The, the investment does have to be uh, funds that you've personally secured and you have possession and control over. So it can't be, like for example, if you're in the E2 context and you were reinvesting funds from an existing E2 business, that's not going to work. The money has to be money that you have and you contribute to the business. And then that, those, you know, that contribution has to be used for job creation. So so that that's um you know that that's the investment in a nutshell. And in terms of differences when we look at E2, because they're both investor visas, uh, one of the big differences between E2 and EV5 is that first of all, for E2, it's no problem to buy a business. That's one, you know, someone selling a restaurant for two hundred thousand dollars or some amount of money, no problem for E2. But EV5, that can be a problem because if the money just goes to the seller, that's not going to qualify. As investment under EV5. Another big difference between E2 and EV5 is that E2 does require that the investor owns at least 50% of the company. EV5, it doesn't matter. You can have even a fractional percent, fraction of a percent ownership um, as long as it is an equity-based investment. That's what's important. And then another big difference is the source of funds. So E2, really, we don't spend a lot of time on source of funds when we're doing E2 visa applications. However, with EB-5, it really is more like an audit that you're doing when you are going through the process. And despite the fact that, you know, every client that we've had, we believe that the funds have come from a legitimate source, which is that what the requirement is trying to prove, it nonetheless is an extremely extensive exercise to go through the EB-5 uh, source of funds requirements. So it's not the faint of heart uh, at all, so something to, to keep in mind. Now, the second big piece of EB-5 is job creation. So you must create 10 full-time jobs, and depending on whether you're a regional center or a direct investment, you're going to be able to include uh, indirect jobs. And these have to be, uh, it's not just any jobs, the jobs have to be for U.S. citizens or green card holders. So that's going to be very, very important. And uh, so we, we do recommend people doing the EB-5 program to register for E-Verify when they're hiring their employees. And um, then the when you're applying as a direct investment um, applicant, you're going to have a detailed business plan that you're putting together. And uh, then there's also going to be a linkage to job creation. So um, the money that you invest has to be linked to job creation. So if you, for example, um, you know, invested in a business and the business already had 10 employees, and you know you invested those ten employees wouldn't count because it was that money that you invested wouldn't have anything to do even if you put the money in the bank account and spent it on different things it wouldn't have anything to do with the employees that are already there so you would still have to create ten additional employees um, and as I said you, you, you know registering with E-Verify is good to um, so the government's already vetted whether the person actually is a green card holder because if someone gives you false ID and says they're a green card holder or a U.S. citizen. Um, you know, that's going to be a problem because at the time of the I-829 application, the, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's definitely going to uh, be a, an issue. Okay, just let me just check something. One, there was just a question that came in here. I just want to see what it says. Okay. All right. So, we'll, yeah, we'll get to, we'll, we'll get to, we'll get to all of those. 
Perfect. So the forms that are filed for uh, EB-5, the forms that are filed for EB-5 are uh, an I-526 petition that is filed that, you know, goes through all of the requirements that you have spent the 800000 or 1050000 that you're going to be able to create the U.S. jobs, et cetera. So that's the first one that is, is filed. The next that's filed is an I-485 uh, or consular processing. So that's going to depend on whether you're in the United States or not. If you're in the United States, you're going to be filing an I-485 application. If you're not in the United States, you're going to be doing consular processing. So if you're in the United States, it's quite beneficial to file a I-485 because you can, as long as your category is current, and if you're um, applying for, you know, if you're applying under the um, uh, under the, the especially the 800,000 category, doesn't matter which country you're from, because all categories are current, then you are going to be able to file for travel authorization and work authorization as well. So that's um, that's uh, something that um, is is uh, is going to be beneficial. And then the final application is going to be an I-829 petition, and that I-829 petition is going to be something that's filed to show that you have actually hired the, the 10 U.S. workers, and that's going to be filed two years after you got the green card. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, so the, the key changes to the program, one is that the uh, program has been reauthorized, this is the regional center program, has been reauthorized till September 30th, 2027, and any filing that's received before uh, September 30th, 2026 will be adjudicated. So th this was a big issue the last time that the program failed to be reauthorized, where USCIS didn't know whether they could adjudicate the petition, but now we have something in, in, in law, so that's great. The investment amount was increased from 500,000 to 800,000, it used to be 500,000. And the, the higher amount used to be a million, but that was only increased 50,000. So that's a relatively small change. It's with only a $250,000 gap between the two. And the changes of TA rules that make it harder to qualify for the lower amount um, that uh, before it was easy to kind of link census tracts together, but that, that, that was a bit of a, the government saw as abuse. So they removed that um, ability. The other kind of thing that's important is that they have a set aside of a number of different green cards for either things in rural areas, for high unemployment areas, or for things in infrastructure, uh, infrastructure product projects. So the what this means is, is that well, one of two things it means. One is that the rural area projects get adjudicated faster. You can have an adjudication within six months, and we're going to talk about timing in a bit. Um, but also these other areas mean that these particular categories, these set-aside categories are current. So even someone from India or China who every other, if, if you're not in the set-aside categories, you're, um, you're, you're not going to be current, then um, the, the, you know, the, the, this is going to be important for um, being able to, to continue with the process and get, uh, get into, get, you know, especially if you're in the United States, you want to file an I-485 petition. The other big change was that you are now allowed to file an I-485 petition concurrently with an I-526, and that's fantastic as long as your category is current because you're allowed to apply for work authorization and travel authorization. So sometimes these petitions are taking up to five years to be approved. So if that's the case, then and you're in the United States and you are able to work and travel without an issue. Um, and then the source of funds, they extended the requirement to do source of funds on the actual administrative fees as well. And they also clarify that with loans, that unsecured loans are no problem. And uh, the, the with gifts, gifts can be from anybody because they were trying to restrict gifts just from immediate family members. And they also added in some provisions that if the regional center was to fail, then um, they, their ability to change to another project. So that's that was useful. The other thing that, um, so let's talk about, you know, EB-5, and this is in particular with respect to direct investment. Um, you know, you can't just set up an entity, put $800,000 in the bank account, and then apply for EB-5. You do have to actually, you might, would have had to invest in some of the money, and you would have to have some commitments and things like that, because if not, then they're not going to think that it's serious enough for an EB-5. Uh, and we talked about, uh, you know, loans and gifts, but the but things you have to consider is if you are, because a petition could take five years to be approved, if you receive a loan, then you have to make sure that you're actually uh, making loan payments on the uh, the the item, because if, if they're the five years later, they may ask, well, to prove it's a loan. And if it's a gift, you want to make sure that the person has actually paid their gift tax in the relevant jurisdiction. So that's something to consider. And then some considerations for purchasing a business. Um, as we said, you can't just purchase the business and then, um, you know, you can't just purchase the business and then, 
to apply for it for EB-5 because that money may not be counted if the money was paid to the seller. So you would have to invest in the particular business and use that money and that, that money that you put into the business would have to be used for job creation. And there's no ownership amount, so you, you know you can own a fractional percentage. That's not a problem. Um, you can never have like a guarantee on your investment, like any type of return on the investment. So that's something that's not not permitted. Um, and the when you're looking at moving from E2 to EB5, we have a lot of people. We have a lot of E2 clients that do move from E2 to EB5. Uh, the investment for E2, you can include legal fees and administrative fees, but you can't for e, EB5. In the investment for E2, we also mentioned that you can uh, be in a situation where you are, um, where you are, um, for, for, for EB5, you can be in a situation, for E2, you can be in a situation where you, uh, you know, the job creation isn't, isn't, isn't that specific. Um, you can hire non-US workers, you can hire, um, you know, really hire, hire anyone in that point to count towards the, uh, the, the job creation, but for EB-5, they do have to be U.S. citizens or, or green card holders. Um, and you do have quite a bit of time to create those jobs. You have two years after the I-526 has been approved. So the I-526 has taken five years to be approved. It was, um, you know, you, you, you could still have, um, you know, quite some time to create those, create those jobs. And the, um, and we talked about the, the considerations of buying a business earlier. Okay, so let's go through an example. So in this example, we say that Helen, um, you know, she had an E2 and she had a visa, the E2 visa that she obtained in 2015 when she purchased a business for $300,000. Um, and then the business had five full-time employees when she purchased it. She paid lawyers $40,000 in legal fees when she purchased the business. So she's already spent around $340,000. At the end of 2019, she took another $500,000 that was given to her as a gift. And the person who gave her the gift obtained the money from the sale of property that they inherited. So, so they, they passed away and they someone inherited the money and they um, you know, gifted the money to Helen. Uh, instead of giving the money to Helen, they deposited the money directly into Helen's business bank account. So they, she never had possession of control of the funds, which would be a red flag right there. When the, the money was invested, she had five hundred. 500, when the 500,000 was invested, she had 10 full-time employees. She started the business in 2015. So over the four years, she had um, created five more jobs, but the money was invested at that point in 2019. So all the jobs were created at the time that she, she invested that money. And then in 2019, she paid herself a bonus of 100,000, right? So she has invested uh, in $500,000, but she's paid herself a bonus of, of, of $100,000 as well. And the company made a, a million dollars. So on the on in you know January she said that uh, yeah I'm going to apply for an EB five and I she said she's completely met the requirement she's invested one point eight million and three hundred thousand initially five hundred thousand and then plus the million dollars in obtained earnings and she's created ten full time jobs so she should get the green card right so and she plans to hire another three or four people but she doesn't really want to do that right so what are the issues here so the first issue is the you know because the the, the three hundred thousand doesn't count towards the investment because the, that she bought a business. And paid the money to the seller. The forty thousand also doesn't count because it's money that's paid to uh, administrative fees and legal fees. So the accountants, legal fees, those those don't count. The five hundred thousand that is gifted to her is a big issue. A few issues. One that the person put the money into Helen's business bank account. The money has to go to Helen first. She has to have possession and control of the funds before. And then also the other big issue is that the the inheritance. Like if the government doesn't care. That the money came from someone you know who inherited. So maybe you know that person who originally passed away. Maybe you know they they obtained that property years before. But the government really doesn't care about that. The government is um, you know you will have to provide documentation related to how that person got the money. Like if the bank accounting was an issue, you would have to provide that kind of documentation. And they don't really care that it, you know the documentation is long dated. They still want to see it. Um, the other big issue with the 500,000 and the job creation is that none of the, these employees count, right? Because the, the 500,000 came in uh, when they already had 10 full-time employees. So none of them really count um, towards, they still would have, if, if, if everything else wasn't the problem, they would still have two years to create the jobs, but, um, but they still need a, bit, a lot more to invest. And then the million dollars that they made in profit doesn't count. And then the other big issue is you have to be really careful 
when you have invested money in EV5 and then you're paying yourself a bonus, right? Um, because it could be that you pay yourself that bonus and then you know you've invested the eight hundred thousand dollars and then you paid yourself a bonus of of of, of a hundred thousand dollars and if the company otherwise hasn't made money then all you've done is taken your investment and paid yourself right so that's a problem a big problem for EV five so you really would have to do some exact counting it looks like this one is in an, um, a TA at least. <laughs> because the unemployment rate is 7%, and, and you would have to check the unemployment rate at the time each of the investments were made. But in, in this case, it clearly doesn't qualify. Time and considerations of EB-5 can take either six months, if it's a rural area, or up to five years. Uh, we often have sued the US government uh, with mandamus petitions but, uh, saying that they've taken too long, and we've been very successful with that, so that's something we continue doing. Um, and there are country-specific quotas, so you do have to look at the um, uh, you know, the, the, the visa bolts regularly. Um, when you have, you know, when you're in the United States and you're, um, you, you know, you have a visa and you apply for EB-5, you have to really take a look at, you know, travel considerations because it could be that you um, have to plan very carefully. And I think the key is planning with EB-5s because they take a long time to be approved and you really have to be planned. You do really do have to plan to make sure that you're not in a position that you um, can't leave the country or fall out of status, depending on uh, your, you know, your facts and situation. And then sometimes people do, you know, have parallel green card strategies. Sometimes people, we have two applicants right now that have uh, approved EB-5 petitions, but they, since then they married a U.S. citizen and they're going to take that route instead, right? Because it's faster, it's so you can become a citizen in three years if you're married and things like that. So they're going to go that route straight. And you can have multiple green card applications pending at the same time. Perfect. So yeah, so let's move to the questions. There are a couple of questions here. So let's see the first one, how to certify a TA region. So that is something that um, only the US government can do now, but there are kind of these TA calculators. You can Google them online and where they, they take the census tract and they look at the unemployment rate and they'll spit out based on your address, whether or not it is actually a TA. Um, for an in direct investment in a TA region, if new business costs $1.5 million, then can I use $800 as cash down payment and the rest $700 take business loan on the business? No, I mean, there are a few problems with that. If the new, like if you're buying it, I described in the presentation, if you're buying a new business, you can't just take the money and give it to the seller and have that count as the investment. The loan itself is may not be an issue in this case. If you were, let's say that you could either have the loan as unsecured or the, the loan as um, the, the business wasn't the security. Um, like, let's say it's personal security, but unfortunately that scenario that's outlined there wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't work uh, for, for, um, for EB-5. Perfect. So again, uh, there are only two questions. So thank you again for joining. And uh, as I said, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation and the video and the consult link. And uh, you know, definitely um, sign up for future videos. And um, and if you have any questions or want us to analyze your specific fact pattern, uh, definitely set up a consultation. And we'd be happy to do that. Thanks again. Take care.